for you, where do you sort of draw the line besides that fish live in the water? Where do you sort of distinguish what is hunting and what is fishing? That's a really tough question. Um, you know, I would say for saltwater fly fishing, especially sight fishing, mostly is what I do. You are hunting. You know, you're stalking a fish or, um, you know, a few fish until you can get within range. And I think that's why I draw this, you know, similarities with bow hunting so much. You know, it, it's one shot. You know, you're going to put it on them. It, you've got to be in effective casting range for you. And it's those fish can see you as much as you can see them. You know, so there's a lot of stalking and trying to keep your your movements to a minimum and keep your, you know, if they're if you're close, you might have to make a sidearm cast opposed to an like an overhead cast. So most of what I would do is hunting fish. These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. The Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by Sig Sauer. Sig is a leading provider and manufacturer of firearms, electro optics, ammunition, air guns, and suppressors. For over 250 years, Sig Sauer Inc. has evolved and thrived by blending American ingenuity, German engineering, and Swiss precision. Today, Sig Sauer is synonymous with industry leading quality and innovation which has made it the brand of choice amongst the U.S. military, the global defense community, law enforcement, competitive shooters, hunters, and responsible citizens. Sig Sauer is also a premier provider of elite firearms instruction and tactical training at the Sig Sauer Academy located in New Hampshire. For more information about Sig Sauer and its complete line of products, visit SigSauer.com. Drew Chacon. Chacon's a cool name. Where's that name come from? Italian. You know, I, yeah, my all right. origins are uh, Calabria, Sicily, Rome, that neck of the woods. Have you fished over there? I haven't. I'm uh, supposed to be headed there next year. So we will see if I can actually wet a line there, or see if I can hunt or do something. Yeah. Sicily has gorgeous water around it. What kind of fish are there? Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. I haven't done a whole lot of research. We uh we bought this trip at a like a charity auction, I think three years ago. And due to quarantine and COVID and all that mess, yeah. it's just been shut down. So we've been trying to get it rebooked and get back over there, but uh we kind of put all the plans on hold and once we get the green light, then I'll start digging in and getting everything scheduled again. Nice. Well, that'll be cool. That'll be interesting. Have you ever gone to a place to fish having absolutely no idea what kind of fish are there? Not usually. I'm pretty much, uh, I, you know, part of the fun for me is the research before. So once the, the wheels are in motion, I'm diving in pretty hard on, you know, what flies to bring, which tackle, what are the prey items there? You know, I'm, I'm talking to all my buddies that may or may, you know, may have been there before. Um, just trying to get as much information as possible. A lot of what I do is I'll go to a location. I'll do kind of the research on what the, the prey items are the fish are eating. And then I'll tie flies based on what I see there to catch the fish. So, I mean, some lodges even bring me down to their locations to do that for them, to design flies for them. Gotcha. Is there any saltwater location in the world that you would go to and not bring a clouser? <laughs> you know, I don't think I ever bring a clouser. You'd never bring a clouser? No. That you know, seems like you, such a staple. Well, when you make uh, your living tying flies and writing books <laughs> on your own flies, you don't usually bring other people's, <laughs> you know? Um, okay, so what is what is your one fly that goes with you everywhere you go um unequivocally my tuscan bunny pattern which is tuscan a, bunny yep it's a rabbit strip um with a 
a foam head, but it's kind of the funny story of that is I, I was trying to come up with this pattern that would be, um, that, that I could cast in front of fish and it would suspend. So a lot of times when you're fishing to like snook or tarpon, they have an upward facing morphology. Their eyes are on top of their head. So you throw this fly out in front of them because if you hit them in the head with it, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like a strip of leather. It splats when it hits. So they spook. So what you want to do is lead them by about a rod length in the direction they're going and let them find it. Like it's their own idea. Right. So, um, I had been trying deer hair and some of the other classic materials, but I could not get it to suspend exactly where I wanted in the water. So I started playing around with foam. And one night my wife and I were at this Italian restaurant and I watched this dude pass a sheet of pasta through that hand pasta cutter, where it just kind of comes out as like fettuccine and a light turned on in my head. And I, um, I, you know, literally was like, check, please, we got to go. And I went <laughs> home and started passing two millimeter foam through my pasta cutter. And then I got hairline to kind of um, manufacture it for me in the exact thickness I want. We call it Chacon's Fettuccine Foam. But we, because you're using strips of foam, you can incrementally adjust how the buoyancy of the fly is. So for like a two aught hook, I use 11 strips of foam and that will have that fly ride about two or three inches underneath the, the surface. But if you want it to be higher, like more of a slider, um, use 12 or 13 strips of foam. If you want it to sink faster, you use 10 or nine, you know, but um, that fly, I have caught just about everything on planet earth with, you know, if it, if it eats a little mullet or bait fish, um, that's my go-to. That's, you know, this morning I caught a pretty solid snook out back and, you know, I just, I don't really change anything but the color with that thing. You know, it's uh, for, for creamy water or like stained water, like after it rains, it's kind of like chocolate milk. I go real dark, like black or black and purple or even gray. Um, but if you're on the beach with it, clear water, I throw white or white and yellow, something as, you know, translucent as possible. Interesting. I mean, what would the oceans do without mullet, right? Yeah. I mean, they're like nature Snickers bars. Everything eats those things. Yeah. I was reminiscing about uh, some of the land-based truck fishing that I used to do when I lived back in North Carolina. And I was so amazed all the time because I was new to, new to the East Coast, relatively new to saltwater. And in the fall, the first time that I saw a mullet migrating down the beach, it just completely blew my mind. Like this, this is like wildebeest in Africa. You know, it, it is absolutely incredible. There's an entire, you know, two or three sets of waves that are seem like they're more fish than they are water moving down the beach for as long as you can see for miles. And it's so great many, migration, dude, it's, it's amazing. It's so amazing. I never even heard of it. Didn't know anything about it. And for those out there who don't, you know, what is a mullet? Yeah, the, the, they're, you know, uh, cylindrical fish that maybe is a, up to 12 or 14 inches long, but they're, they're um, vegetarians, right? So they just school up and everything that's predatorial eats them. You know, they're just kind of like the staple for, for big game fish, snook, uh, tarpon, redfish i mean at some evolution or stage of their life cycle they're the perfect size for everything to eat you know they're and they're they're basically just meat <laughs> you know uh, they're great smoked they're tremendous you know in, in fish dip they're just a, a plentiful fish uh in around florida and you know most of the coastal states so uh, everything eats it you know so it's as far as like a ubiquitous pattern for fly fishing that's what i always go with you know totally. the, you can, crabs are crabs are great but you know crab flies are hard to fish for a lot of people because you can't move them you know mm. when a crab gets scared it goes into like fight or flight and usually it just kind of sits still and puts its claws up so i'm too add to to sit there and wait for the fish to eat i got to be doing something at all times so it's either a shrimp pattern or a or a mullet or bait fish for me most of the time when i'm fishing well, and it takes just right conditions to throw a fly that, that can just sit there. Otherwise, you know, 
the the line is going to cause that fly to move around in a way that isn't consistent with the presentation that you're trying to go for. Yeah. And you got to be a heck of a caster too at range. You know, if, if you're on super spooky fish, you know, and you're making a 70, 80 foot cast and you got to put it, you know, a dinner plate in front of the fish for them to see it. If they're tailing, it just gets, you, you, you better be real good at what you're doing. So is the, is the Tuscan bunny, uh, your highest selling pattern that you've created? Um, it's up there. Um, I think probably my, you know, funny enough, my, my best pattern sales wise is, uh, my contraband crab. And that's because it's for permit in the, you know, tans and greens. And I sell a lot of them in the dark brown for guys that are fishing the flood tides for redfish. You know, it's just a great little redfish and sheep's head fly in brown. So, and, and no one likes tying crab. So, you okay. know, and you, you tend to sell more flies, uh, the ones that are more difficult to do. Gotcha. What's the deal with permit, man? I've, I've never fished for them. It seems like guys that want to throw bait can nail them right off the bat and dudes oh, that, yeah. that throw flies just struggle for a really long time and maybe never catch one, maybe catch one every, you know, once in a while, but what, what, what what's the deal? Like what, I mean, why are people just slamming their head against this wall? They're just an evil fish. I mean, <laughs> what, I mean, there's, 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 there's really not much to say about it there. You talk about uh, some species not having a soul on your other podcasts. I was listening to that. That's the fish. I mean, <laughs> the, their their eyes are you know twice the size they should be. They have great sense of smell. They you know they just they're really persnickety. Um, if they want to eat, they eat. If they don't, it doesn't matter what you throw at them. They're tremendously spooky. So, I mean, it just drives people nuts, the, the level of difficulty to catch one and on fly, it, it's just, and then you hear stories of guys like, oh yeah, it was my first time out, you know, I was dragging the fly behind the boat, stripping off line, I hooked one. And, you know, it's, it's, it's likened to like picking up a supermodel at the bar, you know, if uh, your chances are slim to none, you know, it's, it's one of those deals, but you know, it happens. I, I it took me over a decade to catch a proper permit. You know, I caught one in Mexico that was about the size of a tennis ball by accident, teaching a <laughs> bunch of kids how to cast, but um, I didn't count that one. My my last one um, a few months ago or back at Blackfly Lodge um, in Abaco was 34 pounds. And that for me was like, okay, check the box. You've done it. You know, there's there's a lot to be said for juvenile permit, you know, the five to ten pounders versus like a twenty to forty pound fish. They're a lot harder to catch once they get educated. Yeah. And I'm sure that by the time they reach that point, they've seen presentations before. Like they they've played the game. Those fish can tie my flies right now. I mean <laughs> <laughs> they're they're PhD permit once they hit 30 pounds. Uh, so do you have any other vendetta fish in the world? Um, you know, I've been trying to do billfish on fly for a while, but you know, it's not like, um, that's as technical. It's just, you have to be in the right place at the right time. And, you know, there has to, all the conditions have to be right. Um, sheep's head are difficult, but as I mentioned before, we, um, my buddy, uh, Captain Cody Pierce and I kind of cracked the code using that little brown contraband crab. He's caught over 250 of them on the same brown crab. So for a while, that was really hard for us. But once we figured out kind of their their rhythm you know, and how to catch them, you have, you know, half a dozen in a day now. It's, it's not as difficult. But yeah, I'd say permit was kind of my unicorn for a long time. The, yeah. the, the white whale, if you will. Yeah. The docks next to my house in Carolina, we could go out and scrape those, those pilings with like a kayak paddle or something. And the sheep's head would just come over there. The um, barnacles. Yeah. They go yeah. bananas over that. Totally. But they've got such a strong 
set of teeth and and jaw for breaking up those barnacles i imagine you've got to use a pretty stiff wire on a hook if you're trying to catch them and not have them just crush the hook yeah so p- part of cracking the coat on them is getting the the right style of hook it's got to have a wide enough gap where the carapace of the shell if you tie it on the inside of that hook shank um there's enough room to actually get some meat hooked um when they when they eat it and the other thing is like you said the wire has to be pretty significant compared to the hook size so i use um and this I actually have them on my desk right here. It's a Gamagatsu SL12S um, short shank, but it has a heavier wire hook. So as you scale down in size, typically the wire gets, you know, thinner and thinner as well. But with that, with like a 2X or a 3X, some of those heavier wire um, hooks where they're multiple size compared to the, the size of the hook, that's what you need. So I really like that Gamagatsu hook, and I think that that's a lot of it is they can't bite through it. They can't crush it down. I mean, their mouth is like a cave full of moose horns. I mean, it's just, they are all teeth, so it's hard to get a hook set on them. And sheep's head are funny because a lot of times guys will feel them tap, and they try to strip set or raise the tip, and they miss them every time. And it's because they're not really eating the fly right then and there. The first time you feel it, they're kind of checking it for consistency. Um, they'll pull it in and spit it back out. And then when they want to eat it and they, everything checks out, they green light the fly, they tip up on it and they pin it down. And what they do is they nibble and they'll pull the legs and the eyes and the claws off the fly and then they eat it, crush it. So you kind of have to wait and be really patient. You'll feel them kind of tick, 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 tick at the fly. And then, then you'll feel that kind of doink. It's a heavy bump and the line will start to move as they swim away with it. Cause they've, they pulled it apart. They've sucked it in. And then all you do is kind of come tight, you know, little strip set. You don't have to, you know, give it the full tarp and strip set. You're not, you know, driving nails into plywood or anything. And then you just lift the tip, make sure the leader doesn't, hang up in the barnacles and you got them, you know, it's, it's just a waiting game. Gotcha. Huh? Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, they're a tremendous fish to eat as well. I, I think that was a really, really good eating fish. Oh yeah. They, they get released to the Traeger more times than not. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Nothing nothing wrong with that. Yeah, you know, a little sprinkle of the magic dust from Traeger and on they go for fish dip. Yeah, they're they're phenomenal. What uh what are some other fish that you enjoy eating? My favorite is probably um mangrove snapper or gray snapper. And I, I make ceviche with it. A lot of times, um if we're fishing somewhere, you know, a little family vacation or something, I'll make the leech of the tigre or the, the juice you know, before and have it all loaded up in a Tupperware container. So all I got to do is knock the sides off three or four snapper and cube them up and throw them in there and break out a fresh avocado and some tortilla chips in about a half an hour and you're in business. How do you fish for them? Um, They'll eat just about any small little shrimp fly. Uh, The key is a weed guard. So light, light tippet, like maybe 10, 12 pound tippet and zip it up underneath the mangroves and kind of tick, tick, tick it out real slow. And if you get on a school of them, you can catch it, catch your limit pretty quick. Gotcha. It's, it's funny what, what's considered light in salt water versus fresh water. So if you talk yeah. about light tippet with the trout dudes, they're thinking, you know, something in like the two to three pound test range which, uh, which I'm opposed to under, under all conditions. I, you know, I won't let anybody fish something smaller than five X unless they have a note from their doctor or their mom. It's, yeah. it's just unnecessary. If I can fit the line through the eye of the hook, I think that that's the size tippet that I want to throw, but yeah, that, that also came after a lot of struggle in saltwater when I had a freshwater origin. Um, because when I started fishing muddy brackish water with a fly rod, it's like, I am, I don't know what I'm doing. This is a different game. You know, I'm, I'd give up all other fish for snook. They're my, they're my spirit fish. You know, I, I spend every day that they're, you know, in 
when they're when they're here in you know I say here like in my backyard they're coming down the Caloosahatchee River and headed to the beach you know May June July there's not a day that goes by that I'm not up at night thinking about what I'm going to do tomorrow and having the paddleboard ready and I I'm out for at least an hour a day poking around just trying to watch them and see what they're doing but a light tippet for me with snook is 30 pound and I'm I'm uncomfortable throwing it and if I get a lot of refusals I'll go down to 30 just because you're on borrowed time they wear through it so fast if you actually hook a big fish and I say you know big 35 inches plus and when you're on a paddle board you know you're you're fighting the fish but they're moving you as well even if you're anchored you're kind of on a tether you know you're spinning around on the board so it's it's harder to control and get them to the boat you you like i said you got to be efficient and move quick because their their sandpaper mouth is wearing through that leader every time they shake their head so most of the time i'm fishing 40 pound and when when you show a freshwater guy what your bite tip it is at 40 pound it just kind of it's thicker than their butt section it blows their mind but <laughs> you know yeah no because I, I guess it's all what you're used to it, and a lot of it's a mental game right people um get it in their mind that they need to be using 5x if they're throwing a you know number 14 el caracatus and it's like well can you get 4x through it can you get 3x through it if you cut it at an angle and really shove it in there like <laughs> you know i i bet i can catch that fish on 3x but the the thing for me with trout and the reason that i'm talking about this is I want people to land these fish quickly and release them quickly. If releasing them is their intention, if releasing them is not their intention, land them quickly and, and kill them and get them on ice. But guys that fish really light rods and really light tippets are, are probably unintentionally exhausting these fish too much and then releasing fish that are going to bind up with lactic acid and die. And, uh, and they just wasted that animal's life. And that's, that's the reality of catch and release sometimes uh it's unfortunate and we need to do everything we can to prevent that from happening i i couldn't agree more especially with species like bonefish um you know where you're fishing in you know subtropical tropical conditions and the water's hot and they're already you know exhausted and if you release a fish that's completely depleted it may swim away but chances are it's going to get eaten by a shark because it's just out of juice so i mean yeah could you can you catch bonefish on a three weight or a four weight yeah but probably the more responsible thing to do is be catching them on a six or a seven or eight weight get them to the boat in a reasonable amount of time get them released don't take them out of water you know proper fish handling if you can fish barbless hooks but you know you're not going to eat that fish so there's no sense like you said of just catching it and you know getting your grip and grin picture and then it dying right afterwards i love barbless hooks you get such better penetration on a hook set and uh i don't know we don't have any issue retaining fish that are hooked up on on barbless hooks i'm i'm a fan of them really whether i'm fishing for food or fishing for fun i'm going barbless and then if you accidentally sink one into your neck it's a lot easier to <laughs> come out as well especially if it's a two odd <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you my two cents on that um, I was a casting instructor for years I still am I just don't do as much individual lessons anymore and I got talked into doing a lesson on a guy's tarpon charter one day and he just wanted a tune-up on the boat so I was out there we had a guy and I was you know kind of on the front of the bow with him and he was flailing around like he was going to whip the water to a froth. And before I could get him calmed down, he buried one into my neck. And it was like a two-aught TMCO, like those like grappling hook style, like tarpon hooks. And I, <laughs> I remember thinking, oh, I hope it didn't hit anything serious. And I got it out. It, you know, thank God it wasn't like all meat it just kind of got through the, the the skin and no sooner did he get that thing roll cast in the water i couldn't get down he tried to make another cast and he buried it in my love handle like i mean there's nothing worse than getting something stuck in your back fat and i'll tell you what like after that 
as soon as I get on a boat with somebody, the, the band stalls come out and I'm pinching down barbs <laughs> immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know if you think about the amount of force that it takes for that hook point to penetrate on a barbed versus a barbless hook, there's less surface area on a barbless hook. And if we're talking about a fish that has a hard palate or hard points in his mouth, then that effort of penetration is, is significant, especially when you're dealing with all the stretch that goes into fly line and leader and then the slack that's in the water there's a huge amount of stretch there so if if you're pulling especially strip setting um you're just not moving that much line so you need all that effort going into actual motion and that means you're going to get a better hook set better penetration with a barbless hook than a barbed hook it's physics you can't fight it i think a lot of people also forget that if you do get hooked with a nickel plated or stainless steel or a, you know like a gamma got to like a premium chemically sharpened saltwater hook it's really difficult to get out or even cut i stepped on my fly line many moons ago chasing snook on the beach and i had a two aught sc15 yak hair bait fish tied in this hand which I aptly named the Sanibel Cannibal after that because it <laughs> felt like something was eating through my finger because I, in my infinite wisdom, said, well, I'm going to make this a teaching moment. So I turned on my iPhone and I was like, oh, hey, everybody, uh, I've accidentally hooked myself. Today I'm going to show you how to get the hook out. <laughs> well, unbeknownst to me, I'd never try to remove a hook from my own hand. Every time you give it the yank, your finger moves, right? So then I had the brilliant idea that I'd fold my finger down and then slam slam the the car door. So I, I went back to the car, I got to, or the truck rather, and I had the thing tied to the truck and I was gonna give it the full on, you know, slam the door and just pop it out. Well, I tried that a couple of times and almost passed out. <laughs> um, it, it, so I went home and I put my hand in a bucket of ice water and I soaked it. I said, okay, I'm by myself. My wife was super pregnant at the time. So I didn't want to call her. She was at her office. <laughs> and cause I, I didn't know what was going to happen. So then um, I said, I'll just, I had at the time we had one of those giant sub zero refrigerators. And I was like, that door is 50 pounds loaded with condiments. I'm sure that'll be enough. So I held my finger on the counter and I really leaned into it and I put the fly line underneath and I kicked the refrigerator door. It took one time of that and the nerve bundle was already like coming unraveled in my index Ooh. finger. So I, I drove myself to the ER. I called my wife and I said, listen, I'm fine, but I've, I've had a minor incident fishing. I'm, I'm just going to go to the ER. And I didn't change or anything. Um, I still had my pliers on my hip and these two gals at the ER who were full grown women. These were not little girls. I mean, these ladies shot my finger up with Latticane, held me down and they had a pair of hemos and they were getting on this thing, trying to pull it out and it would not come out of my finger and they couldn't push it through because it was in the bone. Like, it, like you couldn't come through the other side. So then they tried to cut it out, which they couldn't, they couldn't cut it with their medical grade tools. So long story short, these two ladies had to hold my hand and I took it out with the van stalls. And after that, I am really um, conscious about barbed hooks because it was an ordeal. Yeah. And, and then you realize just how great those hooks are. I mean, if you can't cut them with like surgical tools. Yeah. No kidding. Gosh, that, kind of makes my stomach a little upset just thinking about yeah. <laughs> sorry to turn your stomach but it, it's one of those core memories for me now it is uh galvanized Ooh. in my brain okay every time you're uh you're around barbed hooks or kids or whatever i mean i am acutely aware of my surroundings i'll tell you that yeah i was fishing up uh on the kootenai river for big uh for big rainbow trout with my buddy Kyle Nye in uh, Northwest Montana. And we're up by the dam and there's some monster, monster trout. That's where the state record came from in the state of Montana. And it was, gosh, I think that record is over 34 pounds. It's a bruiser of a fish. 
anyways, we were throwing the biggest media flies we could. We had a couple of nine weights that we didn't have any business throwing. And <laughs> I was standing up on the seat of the, um, on the rower seat of the drift boat, trying to spot fish. And, uh, yeah, Kyle water loaded a little bit too long and I got one, two odd, like double hook, double bunny in the left side of my rib cage. And then it's, it's twin in the right side of my rib cage. And he was moving that rod forward too late. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that was brutal. So I got to have four barbed hooks pulled out of my rib cage on each side at the beginning of like a 20 mile float. Like, oh it, my gosh. It's, it's just unnecessary. Like we, we don't, we don't need to fish barbed hooks. Uh, all the time. There's a time and a place for it. Don't get me wrong. There's a time and a place for a barbed hook. I'm not against them in, in all cases, but in fly fishing, uh, in my experience, there's very little disadvantage to going to a barbless hook. And if you're pulling it out of your hand, you'll yeah. very, you'll very quickly notice that there's also a difference between barbless and mashed barb. So if, if you're going to fish barbless, go ahead and buy a barbless hook. Like that's a better deal. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I think we all have our war stories. That's for sure. Um, okay. So you also do quite a bit of writing. Tell me about that. I do. Yep. So I write um, articles for magazines, but mostly uh, how to books for fly fishing, fly tying, paddle boarding, I'm working on a cookbook. Um, the vast majority, I mean, the last 15 books I've done are all on saltwater fly tying. I, I take that back. There's one bass book in there, but for the most part, it's saltwater flies. So step-by-steps, uh, just uh, my, my first book, Feather Brain, was more on creating your own flies, like what you need to do to go to a location, look at the estuary and the prey items and then pick the materials and the constructs and techniques and design your own flies um, for whatever you see. But after that, most of my other books are on specific patterns for um, like a specific species or location. So like bonefish flies, abaco or snook flies or redfish flies. The titles aren't very creative for SEO purposes, but uh, you know that's what they are. They're they're just manuals on how to tie flies that have been really good for me for a specific species. What what travel do you have coming up? I head to North Carolina tomorrow um, to drop my daughter off at camp. We'll be there for a week. Maybe I can hit a stream there, um, but then. Uh, the middle of this month, I'm headed to Argentina for a cast and blast. We're going to do ducks, and then um, it's a little cold there now for Dorado, but there's some silver side fishing, and you know maybe we'll get into a couple of Dorado, but um, that's the plan. Argentina, we're going to be at, outside of Buenos Aires, and then um, back till October, I think that's our next one, and we're going to do an elk hunt in Idaho. Nice. Yeah, we talked a little bit about that at that Traeger Summit. That'll be a fun trip for you. Yeah, I've never really done it. Um, I filmed on a few elk hunts. Uh, when I lived in Arizona, I got to be a cameraman for a while for some TV shows, which was fun, some buddies of mine. But um, my wife is really bent on shooting an elk, which is, you know, about the best problem you can have. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to marry a woman that just loves to hunt and fish. So when she's dying to go that means i get to go twice as much so it's even better perfect is is it a cow hunt do i remember that correctly or is it a bull hunt a bull it's yep, a bull I, hunt I, yeah so i mean I, like i said i'm kind of a neophyte and this will be my first one so i'm gonna gun hunt um i do bow hunt quite a bit but i figure for the amount of time money and effort going into this hunt i'd rather not roll the dice on it if i can you know harvest one that's that's the plan i i can't eat red meat um or let me replace that i can't eat beef but i can eat uh venison or elk or any other game meat so for me it's kind of you know I'm, I'm grocery hunting yeah heck yeah uh i'm all about hunting with the most lethal tool that is legally available 
if they would, you know, let me hunt with a Abrams main battle tank, I would hunt with an <laughs> Abrams M1A1 main battle tank. I wouldn't actually, because there wouldn't be a, a whole lot of meat left over, but you get the idea. Um, I think that it's different for different people and I'm not trying to throw shade here, but coming back to that ethical issue, if the season says that I can use a rifle and that is the most lethal tool that I can possibly use. And that's going to ensure the most ethical and quickest death for that animal. Uh, why would I use something that has a greater margin for error or that could extend the amount of time it takes that animal to die? That seems like an ego driven decision. And for me, I need to check that ego from time to time and be like, okay, am I actually bringing to bear every technical and tactical advantage possible and you know for my ethics that's what i should be doing so if you can use a gun i am all about you using a gun i, I support you 100 percent. well you know for me i mean i i love both gun uh gun hunting and bow hunting i i mean bow hunting and fly fishing are very similar to me the kind of stick and string sports but it, it this soiree i'm going to be going at it with a seven mag because i'm i'm like I said, I need some back straps in the freezer out in the garage. So yeah, we'll good. see what happens. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Good call. No, I'm uh, I'm happy for you. We also talked a little bit at the Traeger Summit about uh, how you source some of the uh, some of the materials that you use for fly fishing and how hunting is the origin for that. Can you get into that a little bit for me? Yeah, for sure. I I tie with a lot of natural materials. I would rather use. Um, like I said, natural fibers over synthetics anytime. I, I think that one, they have multiple colors in them. Yep. So like if you're, if you're trying to match a prey item that's always trying to hide in its surroundings, like a little shrimp on the flats or something, they're not just tan. There's tan, cream, you know, there's some kind of gold, some blacks and browns. If you pick up a little crab, they're kind of modeled. And the best way to emulate that was is with a natural fiber. Like for me, I love coyote because it has all those natural tones in it. So we use a lot of coyote pelts or, you know, other squirrels we use for tarpon flies, the tails a lot. Um, rabbit strips, like I said earlier, and my Tuscan bunny fly are one of my favorite materials because they're so natural and they move so well in the water. But yeah, a lot of materials that um, that are great for fly tying are hard to get a hold of. So you end up having to harvest them yourself. So, you know, if you can shoot a coyote and soft tan it, you've got a lifetime full of crustacean flies there, unless you're a commercial tire. And then you're, you know, I go through coyote pelts pretty quick, but um, yeah, there, there's a lot of just tremendous materials. Like my, my father who got me into fly tying my both my parents tied actually but my father used to you know do his own chickens and you know my mom would tell stories of him pulling over on the side of the road and picking up like dead foxes and skinning them out in his church clothes you know those kind of stories we're, we're not allowed to do that anymore it has to come in a in a sealed package for the materials to be in the house now but <laughs> yeah i mean doing your own is a way to way to go if you're trying to save money I was in Alaska last summer and I was on my way to a buddy's wedding, a guy that I was in the Marines with and we're driving along the highway and there was a Wolverine that had been hit on the highway and we're going to be right on time. If not like, you know, 45 seconds late for this wedding anyways. And I hit the brakes and I was going to stop and go back and get that dead Wolverine. And uh, my fiance gave me a look like, not today. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. All right. You got well. the hairy eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that's, that's funny. I love, I love combining um, hunting and fishing. And I find less difference between the two than most people. And when I look at things like spear fishing or bow fishing, then it becomes even more complicated what the difference is between hunting and fishing. And a lot of the tactics that we bring to certain species of fish have more elements of hunting than, you know, other kinds of fishing do and vice versa. So for you, where do you sort of draw the line besides that fish live in the water? Where do you sort of distinguish what is hunting and what is fishing? That's a really tough question. Um, you know, I would say for saltwater fly fishing, especially sight fishing, mostly is what I do. 
you are hunting. You know, you're stalking a fish or, um, you know, a few fish until you can get within range. And I think that's why I draw this, you know, similarities with bow hunting so much, you know, it, it's one shot, you know, you're going to put it on them. It, you've got to be in effective casting range for you. And it's those fish can see you as much as you can see them, you know, so there's a lot of stalking and trying to keep your, your movements to a minimum and keep your, you know, if they're, if you're close, you might have to make a sidearm cast opposed to an, like an overhead cast. So most of what I would do is hunting fish. You know, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I still, you know, fish with bait with my wife and daughter. And, you know, if there's, if there's an opportunity to catch fish and I don't have a fly rod, I, I'm going to do it any way possible. I'll throw a cast net. You know, I, I do it all. I'm kind of a, a waterman. If I can spear fish, great. I'll try that. Um, but yeah, the, fishing and hunting are pretty much the same for me now, you know, it's especially, especially when I'm using a fly rod. Man, I, I totally agree. Look, if, if people want to follow along with what you're doing, if they want to learn from you and from your books, um, how, how do they, how do they find you? How do they access these materials? My website is saltyflytying.com. And I'm on Instagram under Dr. Chacon. I'm not a doctor. Uh, everybody thinks <laughs> I am. I don't know why, you know, be at the gym and be like, hey, Drew, can you look at this? I'm like, no, man, I'm a fly fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> Drew is already taken. I just went with Dr. But um, yeah, so Dr. Chacon, um, C H I C O N E, uh, on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, Facebook, all the usuals, but salty fly tying is where you'll find my books. I've got a bunch of free books on, you know, how to select natural materials or how to tie with feathers. There's even one on how to get started fly fishing from a paddle board on there. But all my other how to books um, on fly tying are available in paperback, hardcover, or even ebooks now. So you can buy them and throw them on your iPad and really zoom in. That's what I would recommend if you're a new tire and um, you don't want to lug around all the books is get the ebooks and, you know, you can, you can focus on them and flip pictures as you go step by step. And if there's something that you're not quite sure on, you can zoom in real tight and look. And, and I try to take um, twice as many pictures as I think someone would need. So there's a lot of different angles and uh, you won't have any problems following along. That's awesome. That's really helpful. If you haven't tried fly tying, I encourage you to, it, it's not intimidating to get started with, um, and where it can take you is really up to you, but just getting started is not that expensive of, a, of an endeavor. It's a really fun thing to do. It's active. Um, and then when you take that fly out and you go and catch a fish with it, it's an incredible feeling. And if you have some type of connection or nexus with the materials that you made, that fly with, you know, if you went out and you, you know, shot that grouse that you took the soft tackle from, or, or that elk that you ended up tying that elk hair caddis with, or you trapped the bunny that you made the, the Tuscan bunny with, you know, that's a, that's a really cool thing. Uh, it's better than just sitting down and burning up a couple hours in Netflix, I promise. So it really closes the loop. Totally. Yeah. You know, when you're harvesting the animal, then making flies to, to catch fish with, there, there's something pretty special about it. Very, very special. And no matter who's explaining it, you won't understand it until you try it on your own. And getting a, a good instruction book is a great place to start. And there's also, um, I write a monthly newsletter. I have been for probably a decade or so now. Um, there's over 120 free how to step by steps on my website, Salty Fly Time. If you go to the Salty Fly Time Chronicles under the learning tab, and you can go through and peruse all my past uh, chronicles too, and everyone has a, a how to. So um, if you're just getting started, there's all kinds of information on um, just where to, where to begin. I mean, once, once you kind of got the wheels in motion, it's easy. But that's the hardest part for most beginners is what do I do with a vice or how do I get started? And like I said, I, I do it very, very uh, rudimentary. I start, you know, I, as if you've never picked up a bobbin before. So 
it, it, if you do want to get started, it's a, it's a great resource. That's cool, man. And congratulations on, on your success, getting that many books written and published. That's a lifetime achievement and you're, you're only getting started. So pretty cool. Appreciate it. Yeah. I just finished book 15. Um, it's I'm waiting on, uh, the editor now, and, uh, that one should be coming out here hopefully in the next few months. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again for your time. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next time we can get together for, for a hunt or a fishing trip on, on my side of the mountains or yours. Yeah, that sounds great. I want to pick your brain about some handguns next time. We'll get, we'll get into some of, some of the other concealed carry stuff. I've got all kinds of questions. Sounds good. I hope I've got the answers for you. <laughs> all right. Well, it was great chat with you. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm working on building a house this year, which is something that I know nothing about, and I love that. It's exciting. Uh, everything is a new challenge, and there's lots of challenges that pop up. The other day, we were laying out rebar and getting ready to pour concrete for the foundation of the shop that's going to be next to the house. And one of the guys that was there that was helping, one of the construction crewmen, I looked over, and he had a Stanley thermos sitting on the end of the trailer. I said, how do you like that thing? And he goes, oh, I love it. I've had it for a decade. It's like, you know, if you find any environment where people are out there working hard, working hard with their hands outside, no matter the conditions, you're probably going to see a Stanley product there. It's something that just goes with that blue collar labor because that's what this product is doing. It is out there working just as hard as you are. It's going to be there as long as you are. It's going to be there after you're done. It's something that that I feel passionate about with every piece of gear that I take either into the woods or into the workplace, like it's got to be able to outwork me and I work really hard myself. If you are also a hard worker, and I'm sure that you are, then you could probably appreciate the same type of gear. If you go to stanley1913.com and you use the discount code six ranch, that's the number six and the word ranch, you can get 25% off just about any of their products. And I encourage you to do that. They're a great supporter of this show and a great supporter of this audience. Again, I love you guys. And I just want to pass this, uh, this discount and the savings on to you. If you want something from Stanley, I encourage you to get it. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share the show with a friend. You can also rate the podcast and leave a review. Your support allows me to keep doing what I love, which is meeting incredible folks and sharing their stories with you. For more content and photos, follow the show on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast or me at Six Ranch Outfitters. This episode was produced by Emily Brannigan with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Art for the Six Ranch Podcast was created by John Chatelain and digitized by Celia Christofferson. Tune in every Monday for a brand new episode of the Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week.